You've probably heard of how an atom is structured. It has electrons, protons, and neutrons. Well, the electrons are small, very light subatomic particles that have a negative charge, and they orbit the nucleus of an atom. The nucleus is where most of the mass of an atom is located, and it contains the protons and the neutrons. Protons and neutrons have roughly the same mass, and they are much more massive than electrons. Protons have positive charge, and neutrons don't have an electric charge. The model that I'm describing now, where electrons orbit the nucleus, was first proposed by Niels Bohr in the early 20th century. Atoms are extremely tiny. The nucleus of an atom is about 10 to the minus 15 meters in size. That's a thousandth of a trillionth of a meter. And then the first orbit of an electron is 10 to the minus 10 meters from the center of an atom. That is a 10 billionth of a meter from the center of the atom. But 10 to the minus 10 is only a hundred thousand times bigger than the size of the nucleus itself. It seems like a very small distance uh, when we describe it like this, but the distance between the nucleus and the first electron is actually very large at the subatomic scale. Let me give you an idea of how to think about this. If the nucleus of, of an atom were the size of an orange, let's call that 10 centimeters across, then we place that orange in a soccer field, say here on our college campus. Where would the electron be? The goalie net? The seats? The parking lot? Elsewhere? Well, we'd have to go 100,000 times 10 centimeters to go from the orange out to the first electron. And if we go from our location on campus in Valhalla, New York, to the first electron, that's going to be 10,000 meters, or about six miles away. And so that's from Valhalla out to Hartsdale, or even Chappaqua. It turns out that atoms are mostly empty space. Now here's your existential crisis for the day. You are made up of atoms, and atoms are mostly empty space, which makes you mostly empty space. Now, the model that I just described is good for uh, just describing simple aspects of uh, atomic structure. In reality, electrons don't orbit cleanly uh, in circular paths around a nucleus. In reality, electrons exist around the nucleus of an atom in what's called an electron clou cloud or a distribution of locations where the electron could possibly be. In some locations, it has uh, a higher probability of being than in others. And so when we, des when we describe the uh, electron atom, uh, I'm sorry, when we describe the electron orbits in an atom, we're describing the average behavior of those particular electrons. And so the image on the right, I've got uh, the blue dots represent possible locations for an electron around a nucleus but the average location we're going to call an orbit, and that is roughly circular around the uh, nucleus. The closer into the nucleus, the lower the energy a, uh, an electron will have. The further out from the nucleus, the more the energy an electron needs in order to orbit at that distance. And so I'll often show you figures that look like this, where we've got the nucleus in the center of the atom, and then circles representing different electron orbits. Remember, the first orbit away from the nucleus is the first place that an electron could be. This is called the ground state of an atom. And as we go out to further levels, then we're going to higher energies that an electron would need in order to be at those levels. Also, something peculiar about these atoms is that as you go further out, the spacing between electron levels gets smaller. And that means that the energy difference from one level to the next 
keeps getting smaller and smaller the further away you get from the nucleus. And so although the orbits are drawn concentric around the nucleus, they're not equidistant from one to the next. We can also describe how electrons move from one orbit to another. In order to do that, electrons have to either gain or lose energy. And when that occurs, photons of light will either be emitted or absorbed by an atom. So in the drawing that I'm showing you here, an electron is going from a higher level to a lower level. In this case, it's going from the third level down to the second level. In order to go from higher to lower, it has to lose energy. That energy just doesn't go nowhere. It is converted into a photon of light, which is then emitted from the atom in some random direction. The opposite process is called absorption. When an electron goes from a lower level to a higher level, say going from two up to three in terms of orbit levels, then it has to gain energy. And the only way for it to gain energy in these scenarios is for a photon of light to transfer its energy to the electron and thus the electron absorbs that energy and is able to move up to a new level. This is how light interacts with matter. Matter is made up of electrons and so this is how we can describe how light and matter interact. This is an electron level diagram of a hydrogen atom. It's showing the possible absorptions and emissions that occur with hydrogen. Hydrogen is structured so that it has only one particle in its nucleus, a single proton, and hydrogen can have an electron around it, and then you've got neutral hydrogen. That electron can be at many different levels. The ground state represented in this diagram is at the bottom. That's where it has zero electron volts of energy. This is the ground state, and all the levels above that are higher energies. And see that we also have smaller spacing as we go to higher energies between the uh, levels. Different transitions correspond to different types or colors of light. If we want to look at the transitions for hydrogen that give us visible colors of light, we have to start with the uh, second energy level, the one just above the ground state. This is called the Balmer series of electron transitions. You can either go from the second state up to the third or back down again. And so if you go from low to high, that would be an absorption. And if we go from high to low, that would be an emission. For the visible colors of light, there's really just four different energies or transitions that are possible within the hydrogen atom. And these correspond to four different colors. And so if you were to look at the colors that a hydrogen atom is able to emit and break the light up using a spectrograph or a prism, you would see four different colors that hydrogen emits. We'll talk about that in another lecture on different types of spectra. Now hydrogen is just one atom, but each individual atom that makes up the periodic table of elements has its own unique set of electron transitions, giving each atom its own unique fingerprint of colors that it emits and absorbs. This becomes very useful not only to astronomers, but to any scientist that is trying to identify what material they are working with, that they're observing. So for example, astronomers can collect the light from objects in space and determine what elements and molecules exist there. A forensic scientist working in a crime lab can also do something similar. If they want to identify a material that's been collected at a crime scene, they can look at the spectrum that comes from that material. In the next lecture, we'll discuss different types of spectra and the physical situations that give rise to those different types.